Father, we are in your presence with the attitude of gratitude, Lord, for keeping us safe and sound, especially giving us another opportunity, Lord, that we brothers could come together, brethren could come together and uh, study your word, Lord, and encourage each other in faith and strengthen each other, Lord. Lord, I pray the time we are going to spend in meditation of your word and discussion of your word, O oh Lord, may be beneficial to each and every one of us and we may be edified and we may be equipped so that we may be able to work towards the expansion of your kingdom, Lord. Especially this moment, I ask for your special anointing upon Pastor Dan as he is going to teach us. We want to hear your voice through him, O oh Lord. We submit this time to thy throne of grace, asking for your mercies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I noticed that uh, we, are, uh, we are all uh, muted. I think, Franklin, your uh, uh, are you muted? Today, as you, uh, as I wrote in the group, we continue the uh, story of the church, as I title it, or uh, you can say church history. We're going to continue to see how the church, uh, through the ages, developed, especially its theology. Uh, and very clearly, we can see how God was continuing to lead the church in progressive revelation, as we said, you know, no point in time, everybody knew everything, but for some reason, God decided to slowly reveal uh, more and more and more about himself and about doctrine, about uh, ourselves as human beings. And so uh, uh, it's just amazing to see how uh, you know, our belief system developed over the many, many centuries. Sometimes I wish it was much faster, but, you know, that is how we wish. But God has his own plan and his own time frame that he follows. So today we are moving into the fifth century of the church. Can you believe it? 500 years since the church was established by Jesus Christ in, you know, uh, you know 500 years before. And one of the things that seemed to have continued to dog the church in terms of controversy is the uh, nature of Christ, right? Uh, is Jesus fully God? Or is he fully human? Or is he both? <laughs> or somewhere in between? This is something that continued to create difficulty. And I'm presuming even today, there are groups that struggle with this and keep preaching something which uh, may not necessarily be scriptural. So uh, as usual for this particular Bible study, I'd like to use my PowerPoints because uh, I think since the nature of study is a bit on the heavier side, it will be nice to have some writing for it for you to see. So just give me a moment as I share my screen uh, with you. Uh, okay, let me just see. Okay. Uh, let me see if, uh, Mr. Rao, can you see the screen? Is that clear enough? Okay, all right. So you see on the screen, uh, yeah, thank you, Praveen, uh, that we are going to discuss two these two natures of Christ. Uh, like I uh, said earlier, uh, is he fully human or fully divine or both or you know, somewhere in between? Um, and what I would like to focus on as we do this study is move towards this particular council called the Council of Chalcedon, uh, which was uh, convened in 451 AD. So we are right into the fifth century. 
All right. So let me then go and just give you some history very, very briefly. Once again, there is so much information that you have to literally, you know, uh, bring some bare bones uh, so that at least we can follow what is actually happening. So uh, I'm going to give you history first, and then we get into the real theology of this particular subject. Okay, so uh, let me just begin, uh, uh, put on my screen some thoughts that I'd like to uh, like you to notice Na nature of Christ. That is what we are discussing, or we can call it Christology in a theological term that is used to describe the nature of Christ. And as I, uh, if you notice the first point, the controversy continued even after the Council of Nicaea. If you remember, Council of Nicaea was in the fourth century, 325 AD. Uh, they discussed whether Jesus was the same as the Father. And then, of course, later on, even the Holy Spirit came in. Uh, so the nature of Christ was constantly being a problem for the many, uh, you know, uh, for the church as a whole. All right. If you notice, uh, let me see. In AD 381, you had before the Council of Chalcedon, you had the Council of Constantinople. Remember, this was several years after, cl close to 50 plus years after the Council of Nicaea. What happened in the Council, or rather, why did the Con Council of Constantinople uh, come about? Because uh, there was a person called uh, Apoll Apollinaris. Uh, he said, that Jesus possessed only a divine nature and therefore did not truly take on the fallen nature of humanity. Uh, if you remember, we had talked about Gnosticism and Gnosticism also had something similar. So this Gnostic thought continued to influence Christian, uh, Christian thinking. So what did Apollinaris say? He said that Jesus was only divine, right? He obviously, he could not take on the fallen human nature because he was a holy man. So uh, that was his contention. Then came somebody else and his name was Nestorius. Uh, he was from Antioch. He was actually the Bishop of Constantinople. This person concluded, Nestorius, that Jesus had two separate natures and two wills and thus made him two persons, Jesus the divine and Jesus the human, right? He was a double being, he said, one divine and the other human sharing one body. So he was in one body, he had, uh, you know, uh, two natures, two wills, two persons. Now, once again, that caused some problems. Uh, and of course, what did Con Council of Constantinople decide? They rejected the teaching of the bishop uh, or, you know, Apollinaris. Basically, Apollinaris was, uh, you know, sidelined and he said, no, we cannot accept what Apollinaris was saying. Remember, Apollinaris only said that Jesus was only divine. Now, I'm just building up towards uh, the Council of Chalcedon, all right? Uh, the controversy, like you see on the third point in my, in my uh, uh, slide, the controversy went back and forth and even emperors began to be getting involved. Emperors started siding one bishop or the other and hence gave them, you know, uh, gave them uh, the strength to either disfellowship or, uh, you know, uh, or rather remove somebody or, 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 or uh, remove the teachings of somebody. So there was this constant controversy going on. And if you notice, I, in the third point, I uh, put it in invert, I mean, to say in, uh, uh, in uh, what do you call it? <laughs> I'm missing out the word. In brackets, unfortunate. The reason I say that is because when you see, when you get emperors getting involved, when you get the state, when you get the government getting involved in church matters, it can become very, very 
complicated, extremely difficult to carry on the work of the church. And in particular, if you notice what is happening in Ukraine today, with a little reading I have been doing, uh, apparently the Church of Russia, the Orthodox Church of Russia, uh, is very much involved and is also having a problem with the Orthodox or the, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And, and part of the war is being is being blamed on actually the fights that is taking place between the two Orthodox churches. And once again, the emperors getting involved, the state, the, the, the state getting involved and causing many, many problems. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Uh, you probably uh, already have been reading that uh, the unfortunate circumstance of how the church and the state go hand in hand, and then they even lead to war, the killing of people. And I can't imagine how the churches can tolerate that. But the, uh, the, the, the patriarch or the head of the Russian Orthodox Church is very much involved and hand in glove with the authorities that be, and you know who we are referring to, and causing or rather encouraging some of these horrible things taking place in uh, the war, especially in Ukraine. Anyway, this, like I said, the controversy went back and forth. Then came in 440, uh, a monk, a monk called Eutyches. Eutyches also had his own thoughts about Christology. And he said, he denied that Jesus was truly human. Right? He taught that Jesus did not exist in two natures because his human nature was absorbed or swallowed up by his divine nature. So here is another teaching. One says he is not divine. One says he is only human uh, or, rather, uh, or rather he is both, but in two persons. And then here comes another person saying the human nature is completely dissolved in his divinity and hence he has no humanity at all. He is only divine. Okay. So these were what led to, this was what led to the Council of Chalcedon in AD 451. All right. So let's go now to the Council of Chalcedon. Let me rehash some more of the history and then we'll get into theology proper. All right. Council of Chalcedon, 451 AD. Uh, they discussed this controversy. They wanted to, uh, then they came out with what they call is the Chalcedonian definition. All right. And I'm just going to put parts of the Chalcedonian definition here on the screen. But as I conclude, I will read the total, the entirety of the Chalcedonian definition for you so that you are aware of what was actually said. Okay. So, uh, uh, parts of the Chalcedonian definition is that one of the things they said is Christ is complete in Godhead and one of the uh, uh, what do you say conclusions that this council reached they wanted to remove this controversy and basically declare that Christ is truly God and truly human. So they, they maintained that his divinity and his humanity. They also said the characteristics of each nature that is divine and human in Jesus Christ preserved and coming together to form one person and one subsistence or rather and, and subsistence or substance you could say, right? So they went against Eutyches and said that, or rather they went against Nestorius and said that there is only one person. Jesus is only one person, not two persons, right? So this is another conclusion of the, the Chalcedonian definition. And uh, 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 one more, uh, two more thoughts. It also said they are not to be separated in two persons, once again, if you remember, Nestorius said this. 
And uh, one more thought here, one person who is both divine and human. In other words, they maintain the distinction between his divinity and his humanity, but in one person. So this is what uh, some of the Chalcedonian definition uh, decided on and concluded with, which I will read to you a little later in its entirety. Let me just also give you some more thoughts with regards to the history with um, uh, what happened in the, uh, the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, they also considered uh, some of the teachings of the fathers, of the church fathers. Now, let me also say that the gospel, the Bible, the, the, the gospels especially were very much part of their study in the council. And they decided also along with some of the uh, church fathers. And one of the influential persons that they referred to was Gregory of Nazianzus. Once again, you might recognize that name, one of the more uh, respected church fathers. Also uh, a very Trinitarian in his, in his uh, uh, theology and his thinking. Uh, Gregory of Nazianzus has said the following, that which he, that is Christ, has not assumed, he has not healed, but that which is united to his Godhead is also saved. In other words, uh, once again, I'm sure you have uh, heard of this particular quotation from uh, Gregory. What he's saying is, if Christ did not assume human nature, like was uh, one of the controversies, then he has not healed us, right? And uh, he had to assume the fallen human nature. In other words, this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, you know, uh, influences that the Council of Chalcedon considered so that they could understand that Christ had to assume the human nature, all right? And uh, this was being consistent with the gospel message that Jesus Christ assumed our fallen humanity in order to save us. Christ had to assume our fallen humanity, not just our humanity, but our fallen humanity. If he had to heal us, if he had to redeem us from our fallenness, he had to get into it. He had to assume it. He had to take it upon himself. And that is the reason he died, so that he could defeat the fallenness in that death. One more thought from Gregory is also very interesting. Uh, he also said, what he was, he remained. What he was not, he became. In other words, Jesus, as the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, remained as, the, as such, the begotten Son of God. He did not change, right? And what he was not, he was not yet human, he became. So uh, Gregory is maintaining, retaining the divinity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. So what he's basically saying is that Jesus added to his divinity uh, the human nature. To his divine nature, he added the human nature, right? In other words, when he, in the incarnation, when he took on flesh, he did not cease to be divine. He did not cease to be divine. His, human, his divinity was very much there. Now, what is also important to notice is that the divinity and the humanity had to remain distinct so that he could save us, you know, who were fallen human beings. You see, if like one of the controversies was that his humanity or rather our humanity was swallowed up in his divinity. If that is true, then there was no humanity for Jesus to save. You know, if the humanity is cancelled in his divinity, then there is no humanity left to be saved. And that is what the church fathers reason and the church council basically decided on. Anyways, that is some of the history that I wanted to bring forth. 
Now let's get into a, a little bit more uh, of heavy of heavy stuff, and that is the theology, the theology of the two natures as we in GCI today understand. Right. So we we've had to restudy this particular subject, and so uh, we had to do our own research. And one of the persons who has helped us in this research was Dr. Gary Dedo, who is uh, now retired as the president of Grace Communion Seminary, uh, or rather are going to retire, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, he uh, did some of his, uh, you know, he did, he helped us with some of the study. But before we get into what I want to share with you, let us revisit this controversy. What is the controversy? Now let us just... Uh, um, uh, refresh our memory on exactly what is the controversy with that we are discussing. Number one, one of the controversy was that Jesus was only divine, did not take the fallen human nature. That was one of the controversies that the council had to talk about. Another controversy with regards to the to Christology or the nature of Jesus Christ that Jesus had two natures and two wills divine and human, and hence he was two persons in one body. He was a divine person as well as a, uh, as, well as, as well as a human person, right? And so sometimes the di divine person acted, sometimes the human person acted. And so that was another controversy that the council had to discuss. Yet another, con another controversy was that Jesus absorbed or swallowed the human nature into his divinity. Because he was the second person of the Trinity, Jesus absorbed or swallowed up or the entire human nature sort of, uh, con you know, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, fell into, the div into divinity and got completely extinguished. And hence, Jesus was only divine. That was another controversy. And finally, one more thought, let me leave you with. Jesus is only a creature or only human. He was a created human being. And today you know that there are some uh, so-called denominations uh, that are basically considered cults who teach that Jesus was a created person, a, a created, you know, super person. And he thus became or rather remains only a human being uh, adopted or they, they use various words. They said oh, he was adopted into divinity. And so in other words, he was not divine from the beginning. All right. That, if you remember, was discussed in the, uh, in the, uh, Nice, the Council of Nicaea. They very clearly said he was begotten, not made. Begotten, not made. In other words, he was not a created person. He was a begotten person, which is a different definition to it, rather than saying that he was created or made. So this is the controversy that was discussed in the Council of Chalcedon. Let me then uh, move to some more aspects of his theology, all right, of, of the theology uh, of the, the two natures. What we have to understand here is, and what the church fathers came to recognize is that Jesus, when he took on the incarnation, actually was involved in something called the hypostatic union. When he took on flesh, there was a union of divinity and humanity, and it is called the hypostatic union. The word hypostatic is from the Greek hypostasis, which could be understood as either nature or substance to some extent, or maybe an image or essence or person. I think the, especially in the Latin, they try to recognize hypostasis as mostly uh, as a person. Now, this is, let me, you know, once again, uh, getting into theology, uh, this is distinct from uh, homoousias. If you remember, I think when we discussed the Council of Nicaea, 
uh, we also used another Greek term called homoousias. Homoousias also basically means substance, right? So hypostasis is mostly pointing to the person of Jesus, the person, and homoousias is pointing to the substance, okay? In other words, um, the word Hypostasis and homoousias convey the reality revealed in the scriptures that God is one being, one homoousias, and three hypostases, three persons. All right. Now, I hope you can wrap your head around that. He is three, or rather he is one in being, but three in persons. That is how we get this entire Trinitarian concept, all right? God is one being, therefore he is one God, and yet he is Father, Son, Spirit, three persons as Father, Son, Spirit, all right? Uh, the early church had this theological consensus and used the word hypostasis, or, or rather person, which means person, to refer to the three personal and eternal realities, that stand forth in distinction and in relationship to each other in God's one homoousias. All right. So let me come back to the subject. Two natures, Jesus Christ in the incarnation, taking on flesh. It is called Jesus as the second person taking on flesh is called the hypostatic union. What does this mean? This means... He is of one substance or homoousias with the father as regards his Godhead and at the same time of one substance with us as regards to his humanity. So this is where the two natures uh, come together, right? He continues to be one substance with the father, but he has taken on to be one substance with us with regards to our humanity. What are we saying? In short, <laughs> like we always say now, he is fully divine and fully human. 100% human, uh, divine and 100% human. Right? In other words, this is another example of unity in diversity, or rather unity with the distinction of the two persons, right? The person of the divine person and the human person. If I can explain that further, the divinity and humanity does not collapse into one nature. Jesus distinctly has two natures, divine and human. All right? There is no conflagration. There is no collapsing into the two. The union does not does not uh, erase the distinction of humanity and divinity, right? Or in other words, if you can look, not, notice that last uh, line, Jesus did not turn into a third kind where he became neither divine nor human. So what is Jesus? He is both divine and human, but one person. This is the controversy that was discussed and the theology of it, all right? Okay, if I can just uh, quote to you one of, the, one, one of the quotations from Gary Dedo's thoughts with regards to this particular subject, let me just read to you and then, we'll, uh, then I can just make some comments. Uh, this is what uh, Gary Dedo says, uh, how he puts it. He says, the union of the two natures in Christ is a dynamic communion in personal relationship, a dynamic unity where the love of God for humanity and the love of humanity for God meet. The salvation worked out in Christ is the work of the person of the Son of God, bringing his human nature into right relationship with the divine nature and so into reconciliation with the Father, thus making the human nature 
ready to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit in a new way, which we would refer to as baptized by or in the Spirit. All right, there's so much to unpack there. But if you notice one very important word that we, from a Trinitarian perspective, constantly use, relationship, right? Relationship. That is something we must understand very, very carefully. That is, when we understand this whole concept of relationship, then even the Trinitarian concept can be, you know, uh, become a little bit more easier to understand. Not that we can understand it in its fullness, but it can be a little bit more easier to understand. But notice one thing, very incarnation. Jesus Christ, uh, you know, uh, is, is divinity and now taking on humanity, all right? And that remains distinct. It is not erased by one another. It is a dynamic, dynamic union in relationship. It's a relational union that brings out the love of God for humanity and the redemption that Jesus uh, accomplishes for humanity so that humans can love God. And that is what salvation is all about. The salvation, as it says, worked out in Christ is the work of the person of the Son of God, that is divinity, then bringing his human nature, that is his taking on humanity into right relationship with the with the father and here something is very important so this is why we say by the way there is a there is a spelling error there i'm sorry for that person of the son of god this is why we say that uh, uh, jesus christ in his by taking on humanity has won or redeemed humanity are our fallenness and given us salvation. That is why we say salvation is not of works. We cannot work towards this, this uh, what do you say, uh, of, of, of coming to this conclusion, of coming to this situation. Our works does not accomplish this. It is what Jesus did in his humanity that brought salvation to us. So this Two natures is such a very important thought for in Christian, in our faith, in our Christian belief, that it is his humanity. It is the divinity working in humanity distinctly that brings salvation to all humanity. It is not of our works. It is not anything we can do to bring about this, this wonderful outcome of what we call is salvation. Let me just uh, bring in two more quotes and then uh, move towards uh, concluding, all right? Uh, here, this once again, I take from Gary Dedo's uh, thoughts. He says, the two natures, divine and human, are joined in one person of the divine son in such a way that the divine nature remains what it was and the human nature remains fully human though sanctified and regenerated in Christ. So once again, we very clearly establish that Jesus is only one person. There are no two personalities. There's no split personality there, right? He didn't suffer, uh, what is the psychological disease that we call today? Uh, <laughs> schizophrenia or something. No, he was not two persons. He was one person, but he had these two natures in such fantastic union where he his divinity could, could influence his humanity and regenerate us as fallen human beings so that he could present us to the father as fully sanctified and regenerated in Christ through the Holy Spirit. All right, so that is the beauty of this particular doctrine. Let me give you one more uh, thought here or rather two more. Here it says, the divinity of Christ redeemed fallen human nature and restored a real relationship with God. Once again, we bring in that thought about relationship. 
The whole concept, the whole purpose was to bring humanity into relationship with God. How was that accomplished? That was accomplished by Jesus Christ coming in the incarnation and taking on a fallen humanity, not erasing it, not canceling it. You know, we, he, he didn't uh, introduce the cancel culture that we talk about today, but he sanctified it, redeemed it, and brought us into a restored and a real relationship with God, with Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? And by bringing us into a glorified state, notice uh, something which is another important thought I would like to, you to notice. Our salvation does not make us gods. We don't become divine as God is divine. It is real relationship with God in our glorified humanity mediated by Christ. Christ remains the mediator. That is why no human being can be a mediator. No human person can mediate between God and man except the only God-man, Jesus Christ our Lord. Because he took on the two natures, kept it distinct, redeemed it through his divinity, and then gathered us in his humanity to bring us and present us in salvation to God the Father and, of course, to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right. Now I've said a mouthful. Uh, let me then conclude. This was what was discussed in the, Chalcedonian, Chal the Council of Chalcedon. Let me then just read to you, as I presented earlier, the Chalcedonian definition. Uh, it is, uh, I, I needed two screens for that. So let me just, so that you could also see it. I'll read it in its entirety so that uh, you can recognize what was uh, finally uh, decided on and concluded by. So the Chalcedonian definition goes like this. Therefore, following the Holy Fathers, we all with one accord teach men to acknowledge one and the same son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at once complete in Godhead and complete in manhood, truly God and truly man, consisting also of a reasonable soul and body, of one substance with the Father as regards his Godhead, and at the same time of one substance with us as regards his, his manhood. Like us in all respects, Apart from sin, as regards his Godhead, begotten of the Father before the ages, and yet as regards his manhood, begotten for us men and for our salvation. Continuing on, of Mary the Virgin, the God-bearer, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, recognized in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The distinction of natures being in no way annulled by the union, but rather the character characteristics of each nature being preserved and coming together to form one person and, and subsistence or substance, not as parted or separated into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten God, the Word, Lord Jesus Christ, even as the prophets from the earliest times spoke of him, and our Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us, and the creed of the fathers had handed, us, handed down to us. So very clearly you can see Jesus Christ is God, divine, but he is human. He remains human. And when he unites with us and regenerates us, he makes us truly human so that we can have union with Father, Son, Holy Spirit in perfect obedience and love. And that is what we are all destined to. Right? So we are not going to be floating around in wings, but we are going to be children of God, you know, in uh, 
uh, communion with Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right, let me leave it there and then uh, uh, entertain some thoughts, comments, questions that you might have. I hope that uh, I could help you understand, recognize the importance of the subject because I think for Christians, for us as Christians who believe in Jesus, uh, as I was studying this, some of the things came into, you know, into place, as to, especially with regards to how you know, uh, we are saved by Christ and not of our own, not of our works, not of, you know, anything that we do. All right, the floor is open. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Surya Murthy, I think you are the, you should break the ice. You normally do. <laughs> do uh, do uh, unmute yourself. What remains in our mind always is when Jesus was a human being walking in Palestine, what happened to his Godhead? Was it empty? <laughs> right. Well, uh, I, I forgot to say something and I'll, I'll answer your question. I forgot to say one thing which is very important and that is, you see, what, what I have explained is how we in human terms can come close to explaining this mystery called the hypostatic union. Obviously, I have not or nobody has been able to crack the mystery in such a way that we can completely explain everything. So I just want you to recognize we have limitations in the way we explain what we have understood from the scriptures. And to remain true to the scriptures, we must be careful that we don't go beyond certain boundaries, you know, certain boundaries, theological boundaries, because we are unable to experience or unable to express in human terms the reality of God uh, and man and, of course, the hypostatic union. Now, coming to your question, uh, uh, Surimurti, you said what happened to the God Jesus, right? Uh, remember, the, the conclusion that we've come to is God, or rather Jesus, is fully human. And fully God. Now, uh, you may be referring to uh, Philippians, I think, chapter 2, where it talks about that he humbled himself, right? The second person of the Trinity humbled himself to take on the human flesh, right? Once again, there are, there are words there, there are thoughts there, which I don't know if we can fully fathom comprehend with our human minds, but it clearly says he humbled himself. In other words, he didn't, he didn't uh, <clears throat> erase his divinity. He didn't stop being divine. His divinity was very much there. That is the reason why he could do what he did. He could raise the dead. He could heal instantly. Just by his word, he could, you know, uh, completely create a full limb. There was his divinity there. But he also humbled himself into the human, into, into taking on the human nature, where he could experience hunger, where he could experience tiredness, and he could experience death. So where is God and where is human? We see both in Jesus. That is why Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Right. Bertie, you had a thought. The Godhead was in Christ himself. Okay. All right. Would you want to say something uh, more? Uh, the, uh, the talking, <laughs> just to uh, tell Surya Murthy, as much as I understand, there's no emptiness in the God, 
the godhead was in christ when we say father it's the son and the holy spirit when we say holy spirit it is the son and the father when we say son it is the holy spirit and father uh in scripture it's mentioned in the old testament even uh, his name shall be called referring to jesus christ his name shall be called the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace wonderful counselor um uh, and another time it says in the gospel of john the father and i are one and uh, then in the epistle of john uh, the word became flesh the god my point is the god has the god had as we talk about divine nature and the human nature divine and human uh, was in christ okay yeah the godhead was in christ right thank you buddy if i can just say something more and some of you may want to comment uh, uh, you know if i could say this once again i'm just using words which may which may not really express the reality and that is you could say that god or rather jesus voluntarily uh what do you say voluntarily restrained himself restrained his divinity for example you remember what was it the apostle some you know, on one occasion they said that uh, no not the apostle jesus himself says if it is necessary i can call you know how many legions of angels you know right That's now 20. sorry <laughs> 20 legions i think 20 legions of angels right now in other words he could use his divinity but he voluntarily restrained it but that doesn't mean to say he was not divine so once again i'm just using words that once again uh, you know does not fully express the reality of it but we must not make the mistake of thinking that jesus stopped being god uh, he was god and he died in our humanity for our sake murti i mean does it make any sense or uh, am i <laughs> have i lost you no it's all right yeah. <laughs> right pravin if you want to throw in some words please come in yes franklin go ahead so this uh, council of uh, sir how do you pronounce this word chalodian <laughs> no, <laughs> some, some people use various words calcidon or Cal calcidon calcidon Chalcedon, yeah. Chalcedon. Chalcedon. So the council, sir, in my in my judgment, the council of Chalcedon merely confirms what the apostles taught, merely confirms what the church fathers taught. A second observation I want to make is they have made it uh, more uh, clear, sir, more clear as as clear as the noonday, so that a layman can understand both divinity and humanity. Am I correct, sir? yeah i would think uh, what you're saying is uh, correct and especially uh, what the council is saying is what the bible says what the gospel says they studied the gospels and obviously they came to the conclusion that this should be what the church must teach this is what the belief of the church should be on a lighter note who were the emperors who got involved oh <laughs> i didn't write down the names but there were at least one or two at least two emperors who constantly created some difficulties they they started getting into the church you know influencing the bishops uh and uh, this is where uh you know there was a uh, great turmoil you know within the church because of you know when the emperor gets involved obviously he comes with a lot of strength and so how do you counter him and this is what is like i said earlier this is what is happening now in the russian orthodox church the the head of the church kerel or something his name is uh, is very much a uh, lackey of putin who is uh, you know very much influenced by what he is saying and he is trying to punish the ukrainian orthodox church because they declared uh, they declared some kind of separation from the russian orthodox uh and i don't know the all the ins and outs of it but uh, there is one of the reasons for this conflict is probably also influenced by this and that's so unfortunate that christians fight christians and kill christians
Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir, uh, emperors, governments you know, entering a terrain that is not theirs is not fair, sir. <laughs> They are, they are not they have not studied no sir uh, they are not they, are, they didn't study theology they have no business to comment on theology <laughs> that's the unfortunate thing you know in the, that is what is happening in uh, in america uh, where they are they are so called evangelicals are trying to uh, are trying to establish the kingdom of god in the united states of america and uh, <laughs> and you see the mess that's going around and, and might I say, you know, somewhere else that is happening. <laughs> they are trying to, uh, they are trying to marry, uh, uh, you know, theology and, uh, uh, and politics together. And it's a deadly mix. It's a deadly mix. And people suffer because of that. That is why Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. He didn't want to get this, the, the, the politics of this world into his kingdom. Certainly not. Go ahead, Praveen. Yeah, at this point, I guess uh, I, I need to make a few essential comments. Uh, perhaps, I guess, once we cross this uh, Council of Chalcedon or Chalcedon, uh, what happened? We may not be coming back to this heavy theology anymore. Uh, this is basically the end of it. And then again, we come back in 16th century where we talk about a few other uh, stuff. Since we are at uh, uh, the crux, the main, the, uh, the most important Christian understanding of God, I would like to make these comments, which may be related to what Mr. Uh, Suryamurthy also asked. First thing we need to understand is when we talk about the divinity of Jesus, what made Jesus divine? That we need to understand. Many people think that the divinity of Jesus is seen in Jesus performing miracles, Jesus calming down the storm or healing the people on any of these things. But the reality is not that. And because Jesus said, those who believe in me are going to do much more, much greater works than I do. In that case, if Paul and Peter are going to be much more divine than Jesus, if the divinity of Jesus is defined by his miraculous works. No. The divinity of Jesus has to be properly defined. The divinity of Jesus is completely based on the relationship he has with the Father. Jesus, the Son, is divine because he is the Son of the Father. Or the Father is divine because he is the Father of the Son. Having said that, well, where does the humanity of Jesus lie? The humanity of Jesus also lies in his very existential relationship with humans. That is the very reason he born as a human. He came through a mortal person like Mary, just like persons like you and me, through which in his very existence, he is related to humans. So... <clears throat> Where is the divinity of Jesus? It is in the relationship with him. Even we quoted Philippians chapter 2, uh, where Jesus humbled himself and uh, to be a servant. There it never said he denied or he kept his divinity aside. It never said. It said being in that position, he humbled himself to be a servant. Uh, being a king, he came and washed the feet of a servant. That does not make him... No, that does not take his kingship away. That, uh, that, that's talking about humility only. It is not talking that Jesus has kept his divinity aside and came. But uh, because, uh, because Jesus never separated himself from his divinity because he can never in eternity, past, present and future, he can never be separated from the eternal father. He is eternally begotten son of the father. That is where his divinity is lying. So forever he remains divine. Uh, as the quote was well quoted by uh, Gregory of Nazianzus, who said, "He has taken which he which he didn't which he sorry he became which he was not, and uh, and then he remained which he is. That is, Jesus is divine, and no uh, even death cannot take it away from him." Because he is the son of the father that cannot be changed. So the divinity of Jesus is completely lying on his relationship with the father. The humanity of Jesus completely based on his very existence. He has taken a new existence 
uh, of like like you and me and the great thing is for forever he is going to remain like that uh, otherwise jesus could uh, leave this body after his resurrection or right after his death but he did not do that he remained as a man that's where it shows the hypostatic union which he brought between the divinity and humanity so the, the, this is how we need to look at these are called actually in theological terms onto relationships they are called onto ontological which which means which are talking about the existence of somebody ontology means study of existence onto relationships these relationships are defining the very existence so father is the father because of the son son is the son because of the father the divinity of the father and the son and the holy spirit it depends on the onto relationships they have between them so which never which can which could never be broken when jesus became a human he did not break that relationship that's why he always called god as father and uh, jesus when he died and resurrected also that that did not affect him anymore because he is the eternal son of the father that is that's one thing we need to understand second thing is as we christians we also many a times we make a mistake as we read the bible when jesus performed miracle we think oh here we can see the divine jesus uh we say and when jesus cried at the tomb of lazarus so people say you know jesus in his humanity he cried otherwise gee when jesus prayed to the father in the garden of gethsemane if it is you will take this cup away from me uh, where there we think jesus in his humanity he cried no there was no time where jesus acted out of his divinity only or where he acted out of his humanity only in every aspect in every moment of his life he acted as both divine and human because this divinity and humanity is based on what jesus did it is based on to whom jesus related to jesus related to the father and jesus related to the human that is where this complete union between humanity and divinity comes so it is very important for us to understand when we talk about uh, the this is called hardcore christology uh, jesus is 100% god and 100% man and this is not based on what he did it is based on who he became or who he is related to so that is important so if you look in those terms i guess most of our confusions related to this matter would be cleared i think that's well said uh, pravin one of the things i think maybe that uh, confusion comes is uh, you know um, in philippians 2 some translation use the word he emptied himself and when the word empty some would translate as he gave up his divinity <laughs> i think that causes some confusion very simple thing we need to take is he is the only begotten of the father he cannot become unbegotten by trying you am trying to empty himself so the divinity completely is lying on his relationship with the father could any other important aspect of the christian faith and today like i said earlier there are some who continue to struggle uh with with this christology and uh, confuse themselves and that's the reason why orthodox christianity considers some of those teachings as heretical anyone who says jesus was not divine uh, will you know become a cult according to us according to orthodox christian uh, uh, thought yes franklin you had a thought yeah sir uh, the he emptied himself uh, that means uh, christ did not exercise his, his divine powers am i correct uh <laughs> uh no the the word i'm i'm not sure what is the actual greek that is used there uh some say humbled himself uh but uh the the, the thing is his divinity didn't disappear 
right? So that's what we have to understand. His divinity, he, he did not put aside his di divinity. Uh, he continued to remain, he, 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 you know, he is divine and will always remain divine. But he added humanity. He, you know, what he was not, he became like uh, Gregory mentioned. Okay, well, I think uh, lots to chew on. <laughs> uh, let me leave it at that. Uh, you can always bring back questions if at any time there are, there are questions. But, but yeah, we will continue, you know, and try to see if we can, you know, uh, pick up some more thoughts on, uh, you know, church, church history. And uh, of course, we are coming to another crucial point where... Uh, the church split, and there also there were theological issues. Uh, East Church, Eastern Church, and Western Church, and then of course we come into the Protestant Reformation, and that's <laughs> a lot of uh, thoughts to think about. Anyway, uh, thank you for joining us to this evening, and I hope uh, these uh, discussions continue to add to your knowledge and understanding. Uh, so let's close worship today or rather Bible study today and uh, may I go to Vanessa if you could lead us in a closing prayer we would be grateful Heavenly Father Lord God Almighty we thank you for giving us this time where we could spend together and hear your word and know how great you are and no matter whom you are, you are still in our lives to guide us, protect us, and show us the right way. We ask you to please let us be humble. Let us be willing to learn more about you and practice what you preach to us. In Lord Jesus Christ, your precious, your beloved son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And God bless you all. Have a good evening. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.